let's talk about using references. Uh, using references comes difficult to a lot of people because they have to fight against this filter, this backdrop of bad reference memory and bad visual library and symbols. So in order to diagnose yourself, because you can't have a critique or follow you around everywhere, um, there has to be a way for you to diagnose yourself and uh, be able to identify exactly which of these you're suffering from. Is it bad symbol memory? Is it Usually people with bad symbol memory also draw with mistakes without references. But there are some people who have bad uh, just form understanding, but they can draw a really good face without reference. But when it comes to using a reference, they have issues. Uh, and the face doesn't look right all the time. This is because they're facing this bad filter, this bad screen that once you look at your reference and then look back at your canvas, some information gets lost. So in order to diagnose yourself, you're going to have to ask yourself, how much information am I losing because of symbols or how much information am I losing because of that transfer from my eye jumping back and forth between the reference. So luckily we have two studies here today of a student using their a reference to, to, to work from, so we're just going to be looking at those mistakes and identifying which of them is going to be the one that um, is because of symbols and which one is going to be because of just bad bad transfer. Even though they're great artists, for some reason they don't, uh, you know, they don't succeed with references and we're going to look at why. So this piece right here, um, we see a lot of the students pre-existing ideals come in and they disrupt what's happening in the reference. So here she looks very skeletal. She looks very much like a skeleton, very masculine. Um, and that's because, sorry, I'm just going to take off my bracelet because it's going to keep rattling. Fucking fatty. I gained so much weight, I can't even take off my bracelet anymore. <laughs> oh, come on, this I didn't gain that much weight. Anyway, um, so right along here, what you misrepresented is this entire section. You worked so long on this for some reason, even though your reference was telling you, hey, hello, there's an interruption for this. There's another elevation. So the car goes up the hill, down the hill, and then up back up the hill. So here you just made it seem like the car goes down the hill and just keeps falling down. So this is a misrepresentation of the head. And you can see I start with the head right away. And the reason why I do that is because if I have a good plate, I know that I won't have mistakes that are going to throw me off later. So I'm going to start by defusing this jawline area. Maybe get rid of that skeletal in inverted cheek. Now what I mean by skeletal is just search up a, a picture of a skeleton and compare it to this face. We've got these really deep set cheekbones and that's a misrepresentation of the form. We don't have a skeleton. We have a, a face dressed with flesh. So I'm just starting there. I'm also going to introduce that beard shadow that she has. And what you want to go for is accuracy. There's a reason why we're studying references, and that's because we want to learn variety in, in faces. We want to learn accuracy. This is something we want. We don't want to learn, pa learn to paint from a reference and then just paint the name, same old face we always paint. Is that what we want? No. We want to learn how to paint with references so that if there was ever a reference that really inspired us, we would know how to bring it over into our painting. So because the face is different, I mean, you're allowed some creative liberty, but other than that, you're studying this face. You are a student of this face. So please don't assume that just because it's time to paint, uh, period, that it's time to be creative. No, sometimes it's time to just let go and memorize the forms that you're looking at. These are specific forms. This is a very specific kind of face. So what I did was I established that dark shadow there. Another thing I'm going to do is capture what her eyebrows are doing with her eyes. Uh, so we have hooded eyes. This is a chance for you to memorize hooded eyes. So right over here, I'm going to defuse this cheek one more time. Right over here, I'm going to start blocking. So I smudged out the eyebrows a little bit. I'm going to start blocking this value all the way up into the cheekbones. This is another thing you want to memorize in your visual library. What are these shadows doing here? Why are they hovering here? Are you value sharing? Are you preparing for value sharing? You don't need that. What you want to do is preserve as much of this photograph in your memory as possible so that when you go back to no referencing, which is the ideal, you have some kind of backdrop of knowledge to lean on. 
Well, you don't always have to use a reference. You have something there. And it will be a while before you completely work rogue without references. It'll be a while. And succeed every single time. And see, what you did with the nose here is you generalized areas that you needed more structure, and you over complicated areas that didn't need that much structure. So look at this. If you were to squint your eyes and memorize, I mean, and some uh, represent this entire lower eyelid as one value, including her makeup, you would choose this dark value, one of the dark spot values. But over here, look at how you overcomplicated it. We have a line, we have a visible water line, we have another shadow. You added too much information. The lower eyelid of the two eyelids is the least detailed. It's the upper eyelid that has the most detail, and this is the one where you neglected to add information. So I wouldn't call this a complete painting because we go all the way down here into the collarbones and you got information here, but you've got an under-rendered eye. It's all about managing your time and prioritizing your focal point. Your focal point will always be the eyes in a reference. And so you didn't, you didn't encapsulate the most important signatures of anatomy and form here. No, this is a fail. And the reason why I'm being this honest is because it's, it's an emergency. It's a state of emergency for you. You need to pack in as much of the information as possible. And because it's, it's a very well painted, it's good, good brush work. Uh, I don't see a lot of crazy small brush work anywhere. Um, so in that regard, it's successful, but it does not serve the purpose of a, of, a, of a reference painting, which is maximizing how much you take back with you and prioritizing the eyes and learning that the eyes are the most rendered of everything. Instead of adding unnecessary information everywhere, we learn what is the most important add information thereon. Right, so I'm going to throw a quick brush stroke here for the eyelid to show that it is hooded. Areas that you're allowed to be a little bit more creative with is exactly how bent it is, where the bends are. You're allowed to be creative there, but the fact that it's hooded is something that you need to bring back with you. The fact that the eye has fat moving on top of it, not because of age, even you know teenagers who have hooded eyes have just a little bit of extra fat on the top layer. Or children. Children mostly have lots of hoodedness in their eyes. It's all about managing time and focal point. Exactly. So sorry I didn't ask you guys how you were. I wanted to rush straight into the class. I'm so sorry about my delay today. I'm going to fix the corners of the eyes, but the most important thing which I've been talking about a lot is showing where the eyeball ends. We don't see it here, but we definitely see it in the inner corner. And this gives the eyes their circular shape. And I'm going to try to take this render as far as possible for you guys. So you can see just how important it is to prioritize the face first and then move into the eyes as the first area of detail. Blocking in when possible as well. You want to go for accuracy. That's what brings you the success. So what I'm doing now is I'm just going to align the inner inner corners and tuck them back into the sphere of the eyeball. Her eyes are also drifting apart. They are not focused. So it means that she's looking at somewhere in the distance. Also, this actress's eyes are just naturally drawn apart. Then she's got very, very strong brow bones, which is another thing you have to take back with you from your, vis in your into your visual library. This, this brow bone structure is what you're taking with you when you're done the painting. When you're done a painting, you're, you're finished. You don't revisit it, but you take stuff with you. You get a little box and you fill it up with stuff, and then you tuck it away in your visual library and your brain in the filing cabinet, and you call on it later when you need it. Trying to capture that almond shape in her eyes. And her eyes are downturned. Her eye level here, it's not a cat eye shape. The eye level of her outer corner is, is leveled with her inner corner. That's another thing you take with you in your visual library. You see these edges around the nose, how, the, how they made the nose feel a little bit more three-dimensional. Making sure there is distance in between the nose and the mouth, that's another fact that you take with you. How to make a woman uh, how do you create the difference between a woman and a girl in a painting? It's by extending the distance between the nose and the mouth. You can't draw those fairy lips all the time. At one point or another, you're going to have to draw a more mature character. So before your uh, anatomy was a little wonky, falling apart, 
I aligned the inner corners, ready the eyebrows, and fixed the lips a little bit more. The nose I didn't touch because it just needed paint touch, it, like a little bit of a paint touch. Now we're going to talk about structure. So you're missing some major uh, geometry signatures here. You see this really sharp edge right here? A simple blocking brush would have taken care of that. The bone is bone up there. It's cartilage on the lower part of the nose. But at the start of the bridge, right here near the glabella, that is all bone. That means your brush has to be nice and sharp. Wherever there is bone, there are edges. Wherever there is bone, there is geometry. Write that back to me. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can write it as a comment as well, just to help you remember. I like seeing those. It's more of an interactive thing. And I'm carrying this light all the way inside here until I have just the line left over. So I'm not painting in the line. I'm letting the line be the result of brushstroke number one, which is this thick of the dark value, and then brushstroke number two, which is the light value, and the line is left over. And we're still going to go back and smudge all of this later so it behaves more as an organic substance skin. Also, see how far you carried your cheekbone value. That's another thing you brought with your visual library of pre-existing, um, you know, con perception of what makes a face a face. This is stuff that you brought in. You, you, you over-highlighted this area. It must mean she has, is it like a Klingon? What's the, what's the kind of alien that has, like Star Trek, or is it Star, no, it's Star Trek. They have these, like, massive cheekbones. Yeah, it's, it's not, you don't want to throw off the anatomy of the human. You don't want to show unusual anatomy either. So I'm hiding that inner corner. Also, another thing that we want to remember is that the eyes need to be perfectly circular. That's another thing you pick up from references and something that you miss when working without references for too long. It has to be perfectly circular. So what I'm going to do to fix that is just go into look. Vulcan. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> a Vulcan. So you don't want to show off like unusual non-human anatomy. Human anatomy has pretty mild cheekbones, even at the best kind of bone structure. Okay, so I'm just perfecting this right here. I'm not worrying about water lines. I'm not worrying about lashes. I'm only worrying about the subtle changes of that car ride on all of these surfaces. So light, dark, light. Now I'm detailing and I'm bringing in and adding detail points to this surface here. can see another little elevation before that and that's that is the gem that you take back with you this little gem right here this is where it gets the most complicated this is where all my students have trouble this is the area where I see the weakness as soon as I measure the merit of an artist and I'm sorry that I do but when I'm looking at really advanced looking art I go straight to the eyes and I go straight to this little pocket of overlap if this if the artist can interpret the fact that this is a gradient which suddenly halts, turns into a trench, becomes an edge, drapes over the upper eyelid, the eyelid is perfectly spherical and dense, and casts a shadow. If I see that the artist did all of this with cohesion, without some sign, some sign of struggle or some sign of accidental success, if they truly show that they had this under wraps, then I, at that point, really do believe that this artist has, has an advanced level of understanding in their form, which is basically, in my opinion, how you measure the merit of an art. Of course, there's creativity and there's uniqueness and all of that stuff, but objectively, the only thing we can do is measure in science. Uh, subjectively, then everyone has their own opinion of what who does it best creatively. But as far as I'm concerned, it's about the objective interpretation of sciences and the deliberate uh, the way you emit sciences from your work to create a style. That's the stuff I measure with. And if I see that a student has captured this properly, I really don't worry about it anymore. I don't worry for them. I know that they can see a cube. If they can see a fold, they can see a cube. So write that back to me. If you can see a fold, you can see a cube. So try to work on your uh, fabric studies and your folds and all of that. I'm just going to get rid of this line. It kind of extends too far. 
I'm just using a darkened layer for that. But it's all about this right here. So do you guys see that? Do you guys see what I said? Do you see how complicated a system it is? Uh, probably the next most complicated system is breasts. <laughs> yes, uh, especially breasts in some kind of corset or breasts that are just free. Those are really difficult to paint. Um, and I'm not talking about some sort of symbolic drawing of boobs. I'm talking about actually sculpting them. It's because compared to all the density surrounding them, they are the least dense and the most jiggly. <laughs> so drawing them with that be the believable spherical shape, perfectly spherical, pointing down to gravity, and having that low density fat structure, that's one of the next hardest things to paint on a face. Um, eyes are very easy, eyelids and all that, eyebrows just smudge, lips you just over smudge, the nose you just have to make sure you've got a radial value in the edges, but uh, it's this fold right here that is the most challenging, and, uh, and breasts for me, and hands of course, but <laughs> I hate hands so much I don't even remember them. <laughs> Hands, of course, are, uh, you can, you can argue that they are harder than, uh, than the eyes. Alright, then I'm just going to follow up with this shadow. I'm going to carry this highlight all the way around the upper eyelid. Just like, but I will darken it. You see, I'm not going to leave it this light, but I want to show you how unusual it looks to have this value over here, because this is a dark region. It's a, it, the neighborhood is a descent. The neighborhood is a depression. So don't use light neighborhood values on depression values or depression neighborhood. All right, so I'm just throwing that here. I'm going to extend the fat of her, uh, I'm going to actually descend that here, just making sure it's exact. And you'll see how important it is to capture that. And then when we're done, we're going to bring in another highlight. But look at what it does from a distance. It really feels like now we have this in our visual library, this simple, simple structuring of this fat, but it's just done so much for the eyes. It's the tiniest little fat structure, but it's proven that you can zoom in and keep your details intact, uh, interpret really, really uh, micro form structures like this. And again, this is like some of the more graduate stuff that I see, the more difficult stuff that I see um, that professional artists seem to get a good hold of. And that's kind of what I still keep in mind when I'm measuring how much is left for my student to learn. This is pretty much what I do. Smudge tool to blend hard edges. <clears throat> yeah. So then I'm going to think about that edge work here and these scattered wrinkles now that I have everything intact. I'm going to think about what that's doing. I'm going to block in the waterline at the start. It's very bright. It's got a little bit of a shimmer here because of the makeup. And then this white stuff here needs to be more white. It's okay that I've gone over the eye. That's fine. Okay, so the circle shape of the eye is a little bit off here. I need to make sure it's matching hers just a little bit more. But that's why we do reference work. This is it, so that we can encapsulate in a brushstroke or two by memorize anatomical events, let's call them. Let's just call them officially anatomical events. These are the unique instances that faces come in. And if we memorize them, we end up getting this uniqueness transferred back to our no reference painting so that we can work without over dependency on these references. We still have them as support. They still boost our the quality of our work. Okay, and then I'm going to just fix the cheekbone area using a darkened layer, just grabbing one of the darker mid-tones, making sure I'm not over-representing her cheekbones as some sort of equal elevation to the nose or anything like that. But her face is very spherical. 
So it's it's more it's less. Try to see if you can pull off the elevation with the mid tone before you depend on the highlight. So that's a, that's a big note. Write that down as well. You don't have to write it back to me in that exact length, but and I'm going to try to capture these dimples. Okay, and on the other side, there's a slight little dimple. And again, this is what we bring back with us. All of this stuff. See that radial value? That radial value drop on either side? This is a good chance to experience it. Okay. And there is a little bit of light under it. And I'm just going to zoom out and clean it up. Kind of made her smile a little bit, which I didn't want. I think your version is just smiling. I think your girl's smiling just a little, maybe. Gonna correct that here. See all these mid tones? It's just mid tones, but you had highlights traveling for too long. You're definitely not as bad as some students I see who have an extreme uh, dependency on on their. Uh... Sorry, the light's not working. Oh, on their um. <laughs> what am I saying? On their contrast. I'm so sorry about that. And also right here, take a look at the edge you had on the nose and look at her edge. So this is another big problem. We want to see a perfectly clean edge all the way through. Just like that. Okay, so do you guys have any questions regarding this paint over here? Perfect edge, and that's how we make a nose. If you don't know how to paint a nose, please go to the How to Draw Noses video that I posted for you guys. It's a really long video. It's an extensive study on noses. Please catch it if you haven't already, but we talk about the importance of this edge. And it's just right here on YouTube. Perfect edge there, and then I'm just gonna. Cause she does have that wing for the nostrils down, so I'm just gonna build this value radially because that's the cast shadow of the nose. The photographer didn't allow the the cast shadows to stretch so far forward beneath the nose, so some of the nose here got some light. And then we had a little bit of cast shadow there, and a little bit of cast shadow there. And then now I'm just going to smudge around, making sure things feel nice and soft. She also has makeup on, which softens a great deal. I'm not going to worry about the eyebrows being covered. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. So don't worry about the eyebrows getting covered in this stage. What we're trying to do is capture the light under the eyebrow. Forget about the eyebrow. The, bo the bone comes first. The eyebrow comes second, so I want to capture this perfect radial value here. I didn't do the other eye, because I'm not going to do the same thing over. It's going to take too much time. And then grabbing that black. And seeing where her eyebrow starts. Her eyebrow actually starts after her inner corner. So if you, do, if you do have questions, you got to write at Estabat for me to see the questions. I'm just going to transfer some light over here. The eyebrow has a place. And this is pretty much how we're doing eyebrows. We under-render them and we start them as a halo, as some sort of halo of, of black. Um, so what we do is, I typically just do this. I follow the hair growth pattern, so I do this. The hair grows this way. I'm not brushing my brush stroke that way. I'm 
channel, so I'm going to try to capture the thickness and the taper. The taper moves around, it sculpts around the temple. And I'll show you the before and after, and hopefully that's kind of illuminated uh, the method for you a little better. And this is just the outline, and the, the reason why I encourage you to move the brush in the direction of the hair growth is so if the brush leaves behind uh, marks or grain, it leaves them behind in the growth pattern. That way you don't have to detail. Well, typically we're not going to be detailing as much as the reference. Absolutely not. Um, eyebrows have no business being that focused. We look at the eyes, not the eyebrows when we talk to someone. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is smudge the lower half. You see how we don't know where the end of this eyebrow is in this shadow? We can see where the end is at the light, but where there is no light, there is no detail. So that's the exact thing that I'm transferring over here. Because there's shadow, we don't see the ending point of this eyebrow. And I'm also going to do the same thing on the outline. I'm sorry, I didn't finish that taper over there. So if you had trouble finishing this study, this is what was left for you to do. Refocus for the eyes. Make sure you're not over-representing stuff that's not there. Do not let your visual library fill in the blanks. You've got work to do, and that's because you chose a reference this time. If you were going to do a no-reference piece, you would have just chosen uh, no references. So I've talked about how to detail eyebrows before, so I won't talk about it too much now. But all I do is grab the negative color and drag it down. Just accidentally create the eyebrow detail. Negative color, drag it up, drag it down, whatever the surrounding value is around the eyebrow. I'm no longer using the black, because if I use any more black, I'm just going to make the eyebrow look even worse and even more focused in detail. I want to pull off as much detail without actually shrinking my brush or even touching the eyebrow area with the brush. Just the outsides in. I think the light on the eye is too big from your version. So I'm just going to do some final little touches with the contrast here. She does have brown eyes, but they're a little colored now. And I think you just went too, way too strong on the uh, filter, liquify, on this little circle here. And I'm just shrinking it. It's a little bit too stated. <clears throat> How do you prevent the visual library from mixing? You keep looking back at your reference. Easy. You don't stop looking at it. I know you guys eventually, after one or two looks, spend five minutes before looking back at your reference. A lot of you do this. Put your hand up if you do. If you've noticed that if you're working with a reference, you kind of go rogue for a little bit before you look back at the reference again. If you're constantly looking back and forth, you don't fall into the trap of your visual library. You're just feeding what your visual library doesn't have. And that was the point of you even starting this whole referencing thing. All right, so I'm doing these last minute touches. Lines are allowed where you have a line formation, like a lash line or a makeup. I'll throw in some of these. Sorry about my voice. Kind of lost it today. And then you can add the lashes. Now you're safe to add them. I'm not going to add them myself. Uh, but typically what you want to do is just follow that fanning effect. So longer at the ends. Let me raise my opacity actually. No. Uh, longer at the ends, shorter at the inner corner, but they start pointing up. Just like that. I feel like lashes are just kind of like a dress, a dressing of the form that's already there. I don't feel like they do much, and I don't notice lashes when I look at an eye. 
I only notice the iris, which is why I only shade in the iris. On the pupil, sorry, the whole eye area. Um, I'm going to bring in this highlighter. Any more questions? Uh, how do I over overcome the fear of drawing something ugly? Um, I think that's a good question. That's an excellent question. That's not a question I've heard before at all. Uh, the way I did it is, I guess I just one day drew something that wasn't perfectly beautiful, and I liked it anyway because it was my drawing, so that was the love I had for it. Kind of like how a mom, even if her kid is ugly, kind of loves them anyway. <laughs> So if you're drawing something that's ugly, it's your drawing still. It's something that you worked on. It's your work. It's your hard work. So there should be no reason for you to hate it just because it's an ogre. Um, also, I think it's immature. I think it's immature to only want to draw pretty anime fan art for the rest of your life. I think it's immature to not explore drawing ugly creatures and uh, regular human beings that are not supermodels or, or elves. I think it's very mature and uh, uh, empowers your portfolio. Um, so it's, it just depends on how worth it it is for you to do that. What kind of artist you really want to be. You can be a professional and make very immature choices like that. I'm just bringing in some highlight now. I'm just everywhere. I'm following that trail of light. Sorry about the soft brush. I do have to hurry up. And I'm just going to sharpen and illuminate the white here. This should be the whitest white, uh, that light of the, the specular light on her eye. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Rock, advice on how I can make blemishes dark marks on faces look more natural. Blend them and blur them. If you make them too detailed, again, it's like we only looked at... I, I'm going to have to repeat this because it's a photo reference uh, lesson. Just because a camera can see all the sharp details does not mean our eyes can see the sharp details. So when we're painting, we paint as if we're seeing with the naked eye. One thing focused at a time. One focal point at a time. Write that back to me. So if you want the focal point to be the, pu the pimple, Go by it. By all means, go ahead and do it. Um, but that's not, that's not recommended. And it's definitely not uh, how we paint. Unless you are all about pimples and you want to draw them a cover in the weird and all of that. How come the cast shadow of the nose isn't visible in the photo? Because the light has been tilted in such a way where the cast shadow is not visible anymore. So, so I'll show you here on Portrait Studio exactly the kind of lighting that happened in this example. Um, so if you do have a copy of Portrait Studio, you can always set up the exact same lighting in your reference. Uh, it'll help you break down the reference even better. Um, so let me show you real quick. So it's this, this kind of lighting right here. There's no cast shadow. There's a slight cast shadow on the neck, as you can see. It's just because we're seeing from top down. The cast shadow is very, very softened. Um, I'm not sure if we have the softness feature here in this version. The version that's upcoming in Portrait Studio will have the softer. You can soften shadows like this uh, so they're not continuously um, sharp. But that's pretty much the lighting. And this is when we have a longer shadow. Other shadows extend around the face. I also have to remember that the studio is using, in the studio, the, the, the photographer is using a reflector, uh, most likely to diffuse a lot of these shadows. Okay. I'm not looking at the comments at all. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> yeah, but I must. <laughs> Demonetize. <laughs> uh, okay, so you see this light right here all the way traveling down? I'm going to block that in. That's a very important one. I didn't catch it till now. It's nice. As soon as you take a break for liquify or you look at another screen and go back to your reference, you find all kinds of mistakes. I always find something that I did wrong. And I keep, you know, looking away, especially if I'm streaming with you guys during after hours. I let myself kind of just watch a video with you guys or just chill or look at something else because that means when I go back to the ref, my painting, um, I'll be able to see exactly what I did wrong. So taking a break to break the tunnel vision is really important. 
So I'm extending this edge all the way here. We see one thing at a time, one focal point at a time, okay guys? Uh, we do have an edge around the lips that I'm going to try to just add here. It's not a direct representation, it's just like a, you're just inferring the idea that the edge is there. Oh yeah, this little draw here, yes, of course. I haven't touched this entire area here. If you, if, as for the lip texture, you do not duplicate this lip texture. You go for what this uh, student did here. You never duplicate the lip texture. So I'm not sure I like some of these features I added, so I'm just going to soften it up. I don't want mine to look older than hers. So I'm going to soften some of these shadows up a little bit. Right along here. You don't really want to create that texture. Right along here. All of this. I'm bringing in that dark spot around the opening of the lip. Our lip it doesn't exactly look like hers, but what we have captured is the light, dark, light, dark shadow pattern around the lip area here that makes the, the feeling of the lip come through which is that light and then dark and the light and then dark but lips do come in pigmented which is why we're not doing that too much in this piece I'm just going to see how this is a separate shadow location a separate neighborhood from this so I'm not looking at the comments just yet. I will look at them again in a second. Pre prepare your questions. Make sure they're in relation to our topic today. <clears throat> Understood about the lip texture. Good. Okay, and then some more excess shadow here because we will have lashes or we do have lashes. What I do is I paint in the shadow of the lashes without painting in the lashes. So I hope you guys understand what I just said. I just get the shadow of the lashes and the effect they create, which is like a very makeup-like diffusion effect. And... Uh, just add that there to complete the eyes a little bit. Oopsie, wrong layer. I'm going to over smudge the top of the eyebrows and then again just from this vantage point you're not zooming in anymore. You have no business zooming in. You zoomed in when you needed to. Just because the painting's almost done doesn't mean you zoom back in. Write that back to me. If you zoom back in, what's the danger of zooming back in? Can anyone answer this question? What's the danger of zooming back into the painting once you're done zooming in and you're in the late stages of the painting, once you're almost done? What's the danger? Alright. Paint the shadow of the lashes, not the lashes themselves. Exactly. And that helps you develop a more a uh, believable focal point. Uh, you have the shadow of the lashes and by the way when you're looking at the eyes you're not looking at the lashes. We only What you see in your periphery vision and the lo surrounding the radius of the focal point a shadow instead of sharp. Get it? So you don't see the object just its shadow just its blurry blurry uh, image. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm just going to jump into liquify and then just show you what you can do around the neck shadow. But other than that, it's really done. You can keep the neck as messy as possible. You can keep it just like this. No one's going to complain because it's not the focal point. It's on the outskirts of the canvas. This, this parts of the canvas don't have to be here. Um, they don't have to be here. But they we're just putting them there just to create breathing room so we don't feel enclosed. And so everything is not a close-up. So if you did want a copy of Portrait Studio, you can get it on uh, istabrak.com. 
The update is upcoming. It's a promised update. I assure you there is one. Uh, but the delay is only because if we want to perfect it as much as possible so that we can create um, uh, these kind of like profiles for different computer capacities. So if you have a low-end computer, we can make the buffering speed or the cooking resolution super low, but then have the image start to cook and render once you stop moving the image so you can take an excellent screenshot of your reference. Uh, so that's something that we're currently working on just to make sure and everything is done and in place. Um, it's just that last minute little making sure that all computers that buy this can use this new update because everything has changed in it. The light is so much more easy to customize. It has more features. So we worry for your computers or those who have computers right now or laptops who can't run it. You've pretty much never run a game or uh, any kind of game on your computer with this much of this much frame rate or this much detail which is why it's so difficult and why we even chose a gaming uh, engine to um, develop Portrait Studio because nothing really else offers that live lighting situation uh, as well as it as well as the games would and then we just maxed out the the features and the light and made sure it actually behaves like real world light just one big mod Okay, so I'm just trying to figure out the cheek here. I want to make sure the radial values are proper. And the reason why the sale isn't happening right away and will happen after Christmas is because as soon as the update comes out, we want to give a grace period where it will be sold for the uh, spike price because uh, those who did buy it and supported it early on. We don't want to just release it and then give everyone a sale um, and they get their free update and they get there's a, still a sale price on. We still want to honor those who, who invested in our project. So thank you to everyone who did support it and buy it. It's come a long way definitely but it's all about portraiture here and just being able to max out all the efficiency of, of painting or learning. It's an educational tool. It's a it's a painting tool. No one's really made anything like that for us. Us artists have just been in the background. Alright, a couple more choices here that I'm just going to bring in and I'll show you the before and after. Actually, I'm so sorry, I'm a, a real perfectionist with portraits. Yeah, I do apologize about it not being available on Mac. Um, they make it very difficult for they make they make developers developers jump through hurdles in order to release something and I really predict a big shift in migration from Apple users over into PC or anything other than Apple. Um, so I, I, I I'm not really for this whole Apple release, but we will still try for it in the future if it becomes easier. Okay, this half of the eyeball is too light. So I'm just going to darken that and I'll show you the before and after. So your sketch was incomplete because you weren't pushing in the right direction. And this is what happens when we do push in the right direction. All right. So did I get an answer for, for the question? Is it because you lose sight of the painting as a whole? Uh, the drawing ends up looking like Shrek. You don't see the full picture in proportions exactly. Uh, so if you zoom back in after having zoomed out, you've been developing a really excellent plate. You zoom back in, you throw in a brush stroke that looked pretty innocent. You zoom back out, you see, holy crap, this thing is so light and I didn't even know till I zoomed out. And that's the danger. Okay, so before, a little bit too much on the cheekbones. Starting brush strokes, this was not a good area for you to be in. This is not what her face was doing, but you overrepresented it. And you overrepresented all this contrast down here and you neglected the eyes. The eyes were floppy. They were falling apart. I want yours to be a little bit closer to the reference starting out. And close to the reference doesn't, isn't necessary at the ending point. It doesn't have to be the same face. It doesn't have to be the same gender. It can just have the same exact form and, 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 and anatomy signatures. That's what you want to transfer over. Okay. So do I have any questions at all? Any questions, anyone? Regarding this paint over. 
Uh, the placement of the ears, uh, I'm not so worried about that at all. It's not standing out to me. Um, the hair texture and the hair brush strokes would just take care of that. You need to drop another level down. I didn't drop that down because the hair isn't that low. So I just kept it at the same level of the hair instinctively. <clears throat> my former art teacher's advice is ringing in my head right now. Why are you ignoring the change of the form between the cheeks and the mouth? Surely the cheeks are a form as a form or closed. Uh, I'm not sure what you're saying. Is this what your teacher said or are you asking me a question? Why are you ignoring the change of the form between the cheeks and the mouth? You mean, what are you, what are you saying exactly? This mustache right here? This thing? I, I'm not ignoring it. I just don't see it as very, very strong in her version so I just kept it as a very general beard shadow that I introduced earlier. Um, the drawing ends up looking like Shrek. <laughs> what should I do if nothing helps with the intense feeling of dissatisfaction with my art? I do studies and I improve bit by bit, but it's never to a point where I'm even just slightly happy. You don't have to be happy. Uh, you have this, everyone has this pressure to be happy. Um, you don't actually have to be happy. I don't know, I think you're going to end up being happy when you realize you don't have to be happy with it. That's when you're just going to relax. You don't have to be happy with your piece because you being happy with your piece is going to uh, say what about you exactly? That this is a, an absolute success? Do you really think that this painting is an absolute success? Do you really believe between you and yourself that an absolute success in the, is in the near horizon? You're a student. You have no business wanting to be perfectly happy with your work. Um, I think there is too much pat on the back there should be happiness and butterflies with hard work. Hard work is called hard work. It's not called happy work. Um, it, it's hard work. It means that it's difficult both emotionally and the response to the hard work and the work itself is difficult and requires a lot of mileage. I don't know why you guys feel like you have this pressure uh, to be happy. I don't know why I feel like you have to be happy. Um, it's, it's not about happiness. It's about the, the skill set. You're gaining a skill set. You want to be a good rock climber, you're going to have a lot of sore days sleeping at home and capable of finding a good position to sleep in because you're constantly trying to improve your physical body. You're going to be in pain a lot. You're always pushing your threshold. It's painful learning a skill set if it's mental or physical. So please don't feel like you have this need to be perfectly satisfied with who you are right now. You're not. You're still young. Worry about who you are when you're in your midlife crisis, okay? That's pretty much when you have to be worried about who you are. Can you just leave that to the future and for now just get good so that when you do get to your midlife crisis, at least, at least I have my art, you know? So that's something. Instead of buying a yellow Camaro, you can just say, at least I have my art. Develop a style. That'll be your yellow Camaro. Um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. If one can purchase Porsche Studio now, uh, and should it be bought now or would wait till the updates are completed? If you purchase Porsche Studio now, you get the updates for free anyway. You don't have to pay for the updates. We don't have that whole DLC thing. If you don't purchase it now and purchase it after the update is released, you end up paying the full price. So I, I think that's fair. Um, you're very welcome. Mandatory happiness. Yeah, you don't have to have mandatory happiness. Um, it's, it's, I don't know what you mean by I am not young, Mar Mariano. I'm 27, I'm turning 28 in June, and I am not happy with my work. But here I am teaching you, here I am giving you all I have. Um, here I am drawing, here I am exploring what my weaknesses were when I was young and reflecting on them today. My lack of happiness when I was young is why I'm teaching you today because the lack of happiness forced me to keep working. It's not depression, it's not anxiety, it's not necessarily self-pain or, or self-depreciation. It's your desire to get better, to get good. It's your inner perfectionist at a very healthy level of perfectionism. So it's not required of you to be perfectly happy every brushstroke you, you make. It's not like that. It's not necessary. Um, it, even if you're 28 now and you have only just started drawing, it's okay. Because in order for you to continue and, 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 and prosper and push forward, you can't be 100% happy all the time. If you are, you're always satisfied. So what's the point in working hard? Working hard comes with that dissatisfaction of your current present situation and wanting to constantly emerge from it. All right? 
You're always in the shell, pulling out of the shell. One more, one more metaphor, I swear to God. <laughs> You're always pulling out of your shell. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt to pull out and peel off that current state. So I think that's it for today. I'm so sorry. I am very tired and I'm running late. I have to go finish some other tasks up. My voice is completely falling apart. I wish I could look at the second piece. Um, but I hope this was a good idea of what's expected of you in, in, when working with a reference. Prioritize your large shadows. Prioritize zooming out. Make sure you're thinking about edge work. Make sure you prioritize and, and, and focus only on your focal point. Keep your eye on your focal point as the center of all detail. And everything exiting that focal point radially gets decreased by a certain percentage in the tens the, as you get to the edge of the canvas. Um, geometric anatomy is always a must. Form studies are always a must. If you can't read your forms in your reference, it's a sign that you're, you're the kind of student who's trying to do references without a form study backdrop. If your reference work looks better than your no reference work, you need to work on your visual library. If your no reference work, work looks better than your reference work, you need to work on reading your references, which goes back to form studies. And um, uh, being able to flip back and forth, flip back and forth with your eyes to your reference and making sure that you're not, again, seeping back into the bad reference, uh, bad referencing visual library that you have. So identify what kind of, what kind of student you are when it comes to your relationship with references. What is it that's hindering the how much knowledge and how much knowledge you're bringing back? Uh, from your reference to your painting, what's getting in the way, what's the obstacle you specifically in your learning style and predispositions uh, have to jump and, and tackle. Um, and for, for me personally, I think it's um, working without reference. I like to make the face look unique. I end up making it look too unique. So what, I, what I've been doing mostly or too beautiful or too unique, which means that it either looks ugly or too beautiful. Um, so what I want to do is I want to find the middle ground, which I find in natural faces, naturally occurring faces and references. Uh, so that's, that's what I've been doing. That's personally me. Um, so if you like what you see here, go to instabrack.com and uh, go on the little Google Plus icon right here and join the community. Follow the rules. Read the rules. There is currently a challenge up if you want to take a look at that. And uh, I will see you guys on Tuesday. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. You guys are great. I'm so sorry I can't answer the questions. Have a great day, guys. Bye.